Welcome to MassBio's weekly town hall with President and CEO Bob Coughlin. I'm Jennifer Nason, Senior Director of Communications at MassBio, and we're thrilled to have with us today Chuck Wilson, who's the CEO of Unum Therapeutics and the new chair of MassBio's Board of Directors. Welcome, Chuck. Welcome, Bob. Thank, hey, thank you. you, Jenny. It's great to be here. And uh, once again, we're live from the Mass Bio Hub here in Kendall Square in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And uh, I wanna remind you all again, if anybody needs any meeting space that is COVID-19 friendly and compliant, we have it right here at the Mass Bio Hub. And it's also an honor to have our new board chairman of the Mass Bio Board of Directors, Chuck Wilson, the CEO of Unum Therapeutics. So we're gonna have a great discussion today, Chuck. We're excited you're here. Great, it's great to be here. This is my first time in the Hub. I have to say it's, it's amazing. Nice, nice job done. And it's nice to actually see you in person, Bob. It's great to see it's you in like, person as well. It's been like well. four or five months. And, yeah, it's been uh, way too yeah. long, Mr. Exactly. Chairman. <laughs> great to see you both in the hub, and I'm sorry I can't be there. I'm actually out of town this week, so joining Jenny, remotely. your background looks different. Where are you at? <laughs> I am a, in a cabin on the woods, but fuck, I didn't want to miss this town hall. So oh, I took yeah. a little break in my vacation week to join you all virtually. Well, thank you for that, Jenny. And your, your internet <laughs> access is amazing. It is, I know. Did a lot of testing before that. That always seems to be the problem when you're not in the hub. <laughs> um, but thank you again for joining us, Chuck and Bob, for being here. Um, as always, just a bit of housekeeping. We want this to be an interactive discussion. We're actually streaming from YouTube today. So there's a live chat function on the right side. So please ask questions throughout and we'll get to as many as we can. Sure. Chuck, I'm going to start with you. It has been a busy year for Unum Therapeutics. I mean, you announced a corporate restructuring plan in March, and then you acquired a new company in July. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about kind of what it's been like trying to keep operations running so smoothly during the pandemic. You know, what new strategies or processes have you found most impactful? Yeah, uh, uh, great, great question. And I'd say it, the, um, it, it continues to be an amazing year. Lots of things uh, continue, continuing to happen. So the work, the work certainly hasn't hasn't slowed down at all with uh, uh, with with COVID. Um, it's been it's been a real roller coaster. I think you know at the beginning of the year we really hit some some tough times uh, in terms of financing the company, which which sort of drove us to to take some really tough choices in terms of restructuring the company. Uh, and it turned out that was that happened just two weeks before COVID really hit. So as we're absorbing all this change, all of a sudden we're work from home, and you know the people you've been seeing, you know, working with day by day, you know, for the last five years, all of a sudden it's all remote, and it's been it's been really really tough. And um, you know, having said that, though, it's you know we you, you manage, you adapt, you dust, adjust, you adapt. Um, uh, and it's working, and we're getting 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 stuff done. Um, I think, given sort of the nature of our work, it was um, it's COVID has been probably less disruptive than it might be for some some people, some companies. Um, a lot of our focus has been on clinical development. Uh, a lot of it's been focused on the research side in terms of writing reports as opposed to actually doing experiments. And so it turned out actually to be a good time in the sense that people could actually still get things done while, while they were uh, working, working from home. Um, I think we're still trying to sort of adjust and figure out how to, how to sort of work most, of, most effectively. I'd say the biggest challenge has, you know, for individuals um, has probably been uh, childcare. The fact that you yeah. know people are they can get their work done at home, but if they're also they've got a second job taking care of, you know taking care of their kids, that's just just really tough. And I think you know what we've seen is in a lot of ways for a lot of people the workday has gotten longer as they sort of juggle how are they getting all these things sort of done. Um, we rely on the tools like Zoom, etc., to you know to try and stay connected. And it and it's funny. It's like I think we're all getting better at it. Um, uh, I do think that, you know, we, we definitely miss something though. And I think, you know, our, our work, um, you know, is like probably like many places, just very collaborative. We had an open office space used to just having all these incidental conversations with people and building every day that sort of connection to people. And it's just a lot harder to do when you're, you know, when you're working from home. You know, we do, you know, social hours on Thursdays or Fridays. Um, we have a, you know, weekly company meeting where we sort of give updates and those, those kinds of things to, to try and sort of maintain those connections. But it's, uh, it's, it's, hard, it's harder doing that, uh, that, that remotely. 
So I think we're all definitely looking forward to the future where we can be together again. Our offices um, and, and labs still main, are still have been open the whole time, but we've been basically doing everything we can to enable and encourage folks to work from home um, if they if they can do that. Um, but uh, so we have a handful of people coming in to sort of keep lab experiments going, keeping labs up and running. Um, but uh, you know, definitely looking for a future where we're a little bit, a little bit more back to normal. Yeah, absolutely. And Bob, I know and we've adapted in a similar way. Oh, yeah. Our employees are certainly facing similar struggles. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, uh, personally, I was never a big fan of telecommuting and I didn't think it was effective. The good news is, I think as an organization here at MassBio and many of our member companies have been able to adapt. We're a very nimble uh, industry, right? So the ability, and innovative, right? That's what we do. So uh, I think genetically we we're able to really adapt. And, and I've found that I am a believer of the ability to continue to get things done through telecommuting. Obviously, we were very happy that we were able to uh, convince government to keep R&D essential so mm -hmm. that we could continue with these important experiments that, that have been going on for many, many years. Uh, I think a fear that we had, and you might want to be, you might be able to touch upon this a little bit, Chuck, is we were afraid that companies that were, uh, small companies that were looking to raise money, were going to hit a wall in March, April, May, June, July. But we've found that we haven't lost too many. Could you add a little bit of a color to that? Yeah. Like, how are companies raising money in a virtual world? Yeah. No, I mean, it's funny though. I mean, I think that aspect hasn't really changed that much. And, and because mm -hmm. I think the actual, the deal-making process, you can pretty much do remotely. And yeah. so, you know, we were able to, um, you know, close the acquisition of Kick at the beginning of July. You know, we we had never. It was all virtual. It was all virtual. We'd never sort of met the you know the principals on other sides. Never had one on ones with the investors. It was all it was all virtual. And it actually, I mean, in, in a lot of ways, everyone was sort of commenting how it's a lot. Um, you know, it, it's just as effective, and you don't have the hassle of getting on a plane and flying to New York and and you know running around sort of for all these face face to face meetings. Um, and, and, and so from that perspective, deal making itself, I mean, it, it can, it can continue to go. And I think, you know, what we're seeing, you know, just in general, in terms of, in terms of deal making and financing is that, um, you know, this is a, there's a long-term horizon. Um, mm. and so from an investor perspective, you know, what's happening with respect to COVID right now probably doesn't fundamentally change, um, what the long-term investment opportunity is, um. Five years from now, we're still going to need, you know, drugs to cure diseases for which there's not good, uh, good uh, standard of care. Um, and that ultimately, it, it takes time. And inv if, if investors aren't investing now, it's not going to happen in the future. So we really haven't seen much of a change in terms of the appetite for getting deals done, uh, you know, both on sort of the partnering side or on the investing side. Um, and I'd say that's probably one aspect of the business where, where virtual is actually pretty good. Yeah. And if, I mean, if you track the numbers, venture capital investment, IPOs, all moving in the right direction or holding strong. Yeah. And if you look at mass bio membership, I mean, we're as strong as ever. Yeah. So, I mean, that that is very, very, very good news. Yeah. I mean, I think where there's probably a challenge is for the really early stage companies where there's a, a research focus and you basically you need to be getting experiments done in the lab. And I think, you know, for for those kinds of um, you know, early, again, early stage companies with that kind of focus, just operationally, it's, it is a challenge. Sure is. Sure is. Yeah, I know that's all definitely certainly are challenges out there, but it is great to see that deal making is still happening. I mean, we released our annual industry snapshot report was that Bob a week or two ago, and it actually showed that VC fund fundraising in the first half of this year was almost equal to all of last year. So companies clearly are yeah. able to, you know, get deals done and and raise money, which is wonderful. And again, surprisingly good news, right? Yeah, and yeah. and in based on what's going on in the world. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah, Chuck, as as if you haven't had enough going on at Unum, you also <laughs> started as Mass Bio's new chair of the board of directors, I think just this June. Yeah. Um, yeah. So clearly no, it was, it, just not just a few things going on. 
Yeah, <laughs> well, it was a little, can... little, little delayed. I think it was originally the plan was to uh, the um, State of Possible Conference in, in, in April March. Or, yeah. or March, March, yeah, yeah to, to happen. So a little bit of delay, but uh, but it's all, it's all good. Yeah. And, and it means I get to spend more time with Bob. Which well, is yeah, it's, it's, it's time consuming and doesn't pay well, right? So it's a great, great volunteer job to be the chair of the Mass Bio Board. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, our members are thrilled to hear from you. And I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about some of your key priorities, you know, for the next two years as chair. Sure. I mean, I think, um, and just for some context, I mean, I've been um, part of sort of the Mass Bio family for about a decade now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, first joined, I think, in 2009. And it's really been a, a great evolution under, you know, under, under Bob's leadership to see the organization move along, but also the whole industry move along. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, 2009, it was a really challenging time. I mean, coming through sort of, the, you know, still in the Great Recession. Um, and it's just, it's, it's amazing to see where the industry has gotten to in terms of just how uh, vibrant, how large, how many people are involved, the directions it's going in we're at a very different place now. And I think when I sort of think about the challenges for the future, a big part of it is sustainability. You know, we've built this amazing engine that's doing incredible things in terms of, you know, addressing the needs of patients. Um, but how do we sustain that? And how do we avoid um, in some ways sort of our own success, limiting our ability to be, continue to be successful in the future. And I think there are a couple of different, um, things that factor into that. I think one, a big one is infrastructure. Um, it's just really hard to get so many people into the places where, where biotech pharma is happening. Um, just the, over the last 10 years, the, the, you know, the commutes that people have to sort of put up with to get, you know, to get to work. Yeah. We can't um, stop thinking about the congestion and traffic issues. Well, that's the thing. It's like, I mean, you know, you've got congestion, you've got, you know, cost of housing, um, and in some ways, our COVID has completely changed everything. But you sort of know if we don't try, don't fix things now, as soon as we're through COVID, we're going to be, you know, in 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 just just as bad or worse shape than we mm. were before. So in some ways, you know, COVID um, COVID gives us an opportunity to sort of rethink how we how we get work done. How do we how do we you know deal with some of the infra infrastructure challenges? Um, and try to sort of really use it as an opportunity to sort of set the stage for, for something better in the future. And part of that may be um, just changing the way we work. Um, uh, part of it may be, you know, really making the case that now's the time to make real investments in infrastructure, be that public transportation uh, or, or, or whatnot, that ultimately is gonna, gonna be essential once, once things come back. So I think that that's gonna continue to be a, a priority. Um, I think another part of that, again, when you sort of think about the success of the cluster is I think we're at a point where we're limited by our ability to bring people into the industry. And, you know, it takes a lot of training and experience to, to um, you know, to make contributions to the industry. And we're, I think we're fundamentally at some level people limited. Um, and so we really need to be thinking about what are the ways in which we can sort of broaden our reach to bring more people into the industry. And, and I think, again, as you sort of look at current events, I do think that, um, you know, the protests uh, around, you know, related to the death of um, George Floyd, uh, I think the realization of systemic racism and the impact that it has on, on uh, black Americans in terms of keeping a whole segment of society sort of out of opportunity, um, it, it's, it's something I think the society is demanding, you know, we take action. And I think in some ways, it's something we in particular as an industry need to be paying attention to, because I don't think that we're as diverse as we need to be, as we should be. And to the extent to which we can broaden our reach, um, you know, beyond where we are now, I think it gives us the ability to continue to, to, to grow and sustain a really important industry. So again, I think it's in some ways it's an opportunity for us. I think obviously under previous chair, um, uh, you know, we've we've initiated efforts to uh, broaden our diversity and inclusion. I think we've made some some great um, progress, uh, specifically as it relates to uh, gender diversity. And now is the right time to continue to sort of broaden that broaden that approach.
Yeah. I, and I mean, just hearing you talk about all the work ahead, it's so exciting, Chuck. And, and you did mention our previous chair. I think we'd be remiss if we didn't give a big thank you to David Lucchino for being chair for the last two years. I don't think anyone was more willing to pass the baton to you than he was <laughs> because I mean, we had a busy couple of years yeah. and you know, you, you really just did an amazing job outlining the past decade, but yet there is so much more work to do. We're at a critical time right now where we do have an opportunity. You talked about transportation and infrastructure. We can't let up on that. It might not be an issue today because of the pandemic, but you know it's coming back. Yep. So let's continue to keep our foot on the accelerator as it relates to making those improvements. Workforce housing right? Workforce development. And within workforce development, that whole equality, diversity, and inclusion piece is, is paramount to being successful there. Yeah. So, I mean, you just outlined your, your platform as chair for the next two years, and man, we're going to be busy. But yeah. this is all important things that directly relate to us helping patients, right? Yeah. Even like, we, we probably won't get into it now, but to talk about uh, healthcare disparities, right? As it l relates to our quality, diversity, inclusion. Yeah. We need to make our clinical trials look more like the patients that we're gonna serve. We need our workforce to look more like the patient population that we serve. And these are all things that we can do here at MassBio by working with our partners in industry, academia, and government. You folks in the audience have heard me say that a million times. But the reality is when academia, industry, and government tackle problems like this, there isn't a problem we can't solve. Yeah. And we're excited for your leadership and all the entire team at MassBio truly appreciates you and the entire MassBio board for not only providing us the direction, but ensuring that we have the resources to do it. So thank you. Sure. I mean, I think obviously, you know, lots of different pieces come together to make MassBio successful. Um, I do think one part, one of the pieces um, in that is the, uh, is this strategic report, this uh, 2025 report that yeah. I think, um, you know, big project last year led by led by David and, and, and you in terms of really thinking about what are the challenges we need to really make sure we're, we're sort of staying staying attuned to and, and addressing. Um, so maybe, maybe maybe we could talk about sort of some of those, um, you know, some, some of those findings. I think yeah. one of the things I, um, you know, coming back to this sort of this idea of, you know, continuing to be able to grow the industry and being more inclusive, I think if you look at the industry right now, it tends to be very focused on R and D. Yeah. So a lot of research, a lot of clinical work, um, but obviously in terms of bringing bringing therapies to patients, there's a whole um, you know a whole lot more that needs to be done to, to ultimately be successful in that. And I do think you know especially when you sort of think about some of the um, challenges that COVID has exposed mm -hmm. in terms of manufacturing, getting access to basic things like masks. Um, Imagine that. You know, uh, Who would have thought that we wouldn't have enough PPE yeah, and for it's, our healthcare workers? And, and I think it just, it, it really makes the point, you know, manufacturing is a critical component of what we're doing as we, as we try and try and help patients. And, and I think that, you know, as we look to the future, thinking about, well, how do we actually make manufacturing sort of the focus here is, is going to be really important. Yeah, that's good stuff. Yeah, let's get into that a little bit. Chuck, you mentioned our 2025 State of Possible Strategic Report, which really is our guide for the next five years. And it does, it calls out some of those challenges that you just mentioned around infrastructure and talent, but it also identifies you know, four key opportunities for Massachusetts to continue this incredible growth. And you know, one of those opportunities is the creation of what we're calling mini clusters across mm. the Commonwealth, helping to kind of spread the wealth of the industry outside of that Cambridge-Boston core. So I'm wondering if both you and Bob can talk a little bit about, you know, why this is such a ripe opportunity and share insights on how we can support this kind of growth, you know, even if it is, like you mentioned, around kind of manufacturing. Um, Bob, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, and it's perfect to riff right off of what Chuck was just saying as it relates to, let's go back in time. We were pushing R&D, R&D, R&D. We were the best place in the world for R&D, but look what's happened. We have trickled in this manufacturing opportunity and we're very successful at it because of the workforce that we have here in Massachusetts. And it doesn't necessarily need to be in Cambridge or Boston to do that. So when we've seen these micro clusters and we need to encourage that as the, you know, the, the Life Sciences Trade Association to encourage folks to move to these different parts of the state. And what does that mean? It means, it means several things. When you look at 
why we started manufacturing it was because we're really good at large molecule manufacturing but now look at cell and gene therapy and where yeah, so. the industry is gone we're good at making vectors. We're good at making complicated, manufacturing complicated things to get away from the scientific terms, like tricky stuff to make. We're good at that here in Massachusetts. So let's play those strains. So what is it that we need to do as a cluster and as a community to encourage companies to come here to make this tricky stuff? Well, that sprawls outside of Cambridge. It sprawls outside of Boston. You look at 495 and 93 and Route 90. I mean, look at the cluster that Worcester is on its own right now. Look at the North Shore, the South Shore. What we're doing out in Springfield and the Berkshires. We're going, going all the way out to the New York border right now and creating these mini clusters that in their own right will be major nationally ranked clusters in the future if we do it right. And we do that by not just focusing on the different aspects of the industry like manufacturing, et cetera, but also let's capitalize on digital health. Let's capitalize on combination products. Let's capitalize on uh, devices and diagnostics in the, in the life sciences space. It's not just biotech anymore. Our partnership with MassMedic and working with Brian Johnson there is a perfect example of how we're trying to all work together to really be the best place and continue to be the best place in the world for the life sciences, which is much bigger than just biotech, you know, and the original Biogen and Genzyme Integrated Genetics, Genetics Institutes of the world, remember? Yeah. So it's like, it, it's much bigger than that. And, and I think the State of Possible 2025 report and those four pillars for us to focus on, uh, it, it's really going to, again, like you outlined in your priorities and your agenda, it's going to keep us very busy moving forward. And it's all really, really good stuff. Yeah. I mean, if, if you look back sort of historically, I mean, in a lot of ways, it does make sense that biotech sort of is here in Cambridge when you sort of think about proximity to the great universities and to the medical centers um, mm -hmm. and to the finance people. I mean, those are sort of in some ways are the key pieces you need to sort of get get things started when you have an R&D focus. Um, but as you think about growing more broadly and, you know, uh, when you talk about sort of other aspects of the industry moving beyond just a focus on therapeutics to think about diagnostics, mm -hmm. think about vaccines, think about um, uh, testing. I mean, there's there's all sorts of um, uh, you know opportunity there, and you don't necessarily need to rely on those same sort of cores, yeah. core, core capabilities that made made Cambridge sort of the uh, you know the focal point for for the start of the industry. Um, and just when you come back to sort of some of the infra infrastructure challenges, in some ways it just doesn't make sense to keep piling everything in, uh, in into Kendall Square. It's a great place to be, but sure uh, but um, you know there's so many other communities I think that could benefit from the industry, and you know frankly they're just as well positioned to, to make a difference. Yeah, in a sense, you're creating the jobs closer to where the people live. Right. And that's that's a win-win all around. And a lot of our member companies have been asking for that. So we, these searches that are going on, we're showing people opportunity, showing member companies pieces of land uh, across the Commonwealth. And that's very exciting. Yeah. Very exciting. I mean, you, you touched on sort of the opportunity in digital health. And I do think, you know, as you sort of think about the future um, and this sort of idea of sustainability, you know, if there's, a, if there's sort of a concern, it's like, you know, what's the next, you know, we can keep doing what we're doing um, and be successful at it, but you know, what's the potential for some sort of disruptive technology to right. just fundamentally change the way, um, you know, the way you address patients, patients on that medical needs. Mm -hmm. and, and it could come from a, from an app, it could come sure. from better data management. It could come from artificial intelligence or looking at uh, doing more with more with data. And so I think as we think about continuing to have a sustainable cluster, a big part of it is thinking about well, what is that next disruption and making sure that we're taking the appropriate steps to allow us to sort of move into those other directions um, if that's ultimately the way the industry is going to go and how we're going to be continue, continue to be successful. But if you think about it, that's how we became the best place in the world for this industry. We were focusing on therapies that change the course of disease and in some cases cure disease, not me too drugs, right? Yep. So now people always say, well, what do you do when you're on, how do you stay on top? Right, we got to think about what's next, yep. and that's what we're doing. Yep. That's what we're doing. Absolutely, and we have a question from the audience. I think that builds upon everything you're talking about. 
Jonathan is wondering what you see as the biggest need operationally for companies about to hit their growth spurt. Chuck, do you want to start with that one? Wow. Uh, <laughs> operationally, um, as they're facing a growth spurt. Yeah. Yep. I mean, it's, I mean, um, I think we're sort of in that phase right now in the sense yeah. of, you know, having brought on a sort of a big dollop of financing, we're looking to build an organization and, you know, jump into the clinic in three different indications next year and identifying employees that you've never physically met. And, you know, ha you can, you can do, go through the whole sort of interview process, but it's just, it's a, it's a different, different way of doing it. And I think the, you know, the biggest challenge I think we're, we're facing is, um, Again, how do you find that talent pool that's going to drive the company in the future? One thing we recently decided, I mean, we've, we've always been, you know, we've had a very collaborative um, sort of workspace, really value teamwork. Um, and, and part of that was an assumption that people were local and people were going to be working in the office together. Um, I think recognizing the challenge, we basically just made the decision, you know, we're actually going to go, go national. We're going to be hiring people who may not be, you know, within driving distance, but who can contribute remotely and, you know, see how that works. And ultimately, um, you know, if that's the way that we can access talent, you know, that, that'll be a, be a component of it. Um, but I think, you know, from a, from a fundamental, um, you know, what's the driver, it really is, I think, talent and figuring out, and it comes back to this idea of we need to continue to sort of broaden the pool of people that are, uh, that are um, coming into the industry and contributing to the industry. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. What I'm hearing from member companies, it's talent, talent, talent. I mean, the way the, that's our natural resource, right? We have smart people that are good at this, that are not, people don't come here because the weather's great year round, right? They didn't come here because traffic was good. They come here because of the people. And if we don't continue to grow that pipeline of people, we will not be able to sustain the growth that we've experienced. Yeah. So yeah, I agree with that. Absolutely. And believe it or not, we only have two minutes left. So I'm going to keep this last podcast. question <laughs> really short. <laughs> um, but if each of you could tell me in you know, about a minute, what keeps you up at night? Bob, why don't you start? Can, I can't tell anyone anything in a minute, in less than a minute. So I'll try. <laughs> challenge. Let, me, let me tell you real quick, what keeps me up at night? The fact that we still have a sick care system and we don't have a health care system. We have amazing people that go to work every day at amazing companies that invent therapies that change the course of disease and in some cases cure disease and we have a payer system a private insurance payer system that has not innovated as quickly that, as we have and you know I'm, that scares the daylights out of me because if these therapies have large upfront costs but huge savings down the line and we don't have an, a system a, a healthcare system that can account for costs avoided, we're in trouble. Uh, another thing real quick, and I'll take 10 seconds that keeps me awake at night. You know, we've gone from being an industry that was vilified in a sense to an industry that everybody loves because we're working really hard. 85 companies in Massachusetts proper are working on COVID-19 related, whether it's diagnostics, therapeutics, or vaccines to, to the beloved industry our key opinion leaders and politicians going to forget after this is all said and done. That keeps me up at night as well. So ladies and gentlemen, we need to figure out how we can continue to let people know that everyone who's walking on the earth right now is waiting for a therapy that will help them uh, combat an unmet medical need called COVID-19. And we can't let people forget. I'll wrap it up there. I don't know if that was a minute or not, Jenny. But over Perfect. Here, well said, Bob. How about you, Chuck? What keeps you up at uh, night? I, actually, it's the same thing you finished on. I mean, I think, you know, with COVID, we've got to, we've got to figure out COVID. And I think, you know, it's enormous promise, potential promise in vaccines. But there are so many things that could go wrong. We've never, we've never seen this before where you're trying to, you know, cure a disease, or, uh, vaccinate against a disease in eight months. And, but that's pretty much what we need to do. And um, I think... It's great to see the efforts are going into to making that happen, but I think uh, it's going to be a lot of work from people like uh, like us in this industry to make sure that that's successful. Perfect. Well, thank you both so much for joining. We're, you know, Chuck, we're really looking forward to the next two years with you as chair to tackle some of these challenges and capitalize on these opportunities. And audience, thank you for joining. This is our last town hall for the summer. Um, so we hope we'll see you again on September 8th, where we're going to discuss what you both touched upon, some of the latest innovations around digital health. 
So have a great rest of your August and we'll see you in September. All right. Thank Bye, you. Bye folks. See you in September.